most of us would have heard about the Chosen series. Who's watched a bit of the Chosen series? Okay, really want to encourage you to get it. It's on, there's an app you can just download. Season four is coming out. It's been so good. It just reveals Jesus to you in a way that, yeah, just a fresh way of seeing, seeing Christ. And in the series at some point, I think the previous season, uh, an, another character, another disciple came into the picture, uh, one with the name of Judas. And he's a nice guy. The character's a nice guy, and you're really like, oh, I really want to start just weeping because I can see, because we know what's coming. Judas Iscariot is going to betray Jesus, and he's such a nice guy, you know, and, and, and so I just know it's going to really affect us. But so we see in the, in, among the disciples, we see these, these extremes. We see on the one hand, We see John, the beloved, the one that was close to Jesus, the one who put his head on Jesus' chest, the one that knew Jesus like like none of the others. He was just really, really close to Jesus. Okay, John, the beloved. And on the other hand, we have Judas. Judas who betrayed Jesus. Now think, I mean, he walked with Jesus for three years. Walking with God who became flesh. He saw the miracles. I mean, God did miracles through his ministry. He went out with the other disciples. And so you have Judas betraying Jesus with a kiss to reveal to the soldiers that came to take Jesus, to reveal to them who is the, 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 one, the, the, the one that they must take. So how does this work? How can you have in the same group of 12, the apostles, the chosen ones? On the one hand, you have John the beloved. On the other hand, you have Judas the betrayer. I believe every one of us have this in us. Every one of us, any one of us could be John the beloved. Or we could be Judas the betrayer. Why did Judas betray Jesus, do you know? Because the Bible tells us. Judas loved money. He was a thief. He stole. He stole from the ministry's finances. And so there was an idol, what it comes down to, there was an idol in Judas's heart. There was another God. His love for money opened the door for evil to come into his life, and then ultimately he betrayed Jesus. Now, I'm sure he didn't get start off with, hey, I'm going to betray Jesus. I'm going to be the villain of the story for all of eternity. No, he's a nice guy. He was sincere. He came in wanting to follow Jesus. He laid down all his things and the business things and whatever, and he followed, he followed Jesus. But there was an idol. There was another God, and that's the issue. And I believe any one of us, if we allow an idol into our hearts, something that competes with Jesus, something that we exalt above Jesus in our lives, the result is you're going to betray Christ. You're going to betray Jesus with your actions, with your words, with your lifestyle, you didn't, you didn't get out planning to do it. But I tell you, the moment another God, another, an idol uh, is given space in our lives, it's an open door, evil comes in. As with Judas, he was, I mean, the devil literally entered him and he betrayed Jesus. So this is massive. The, 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 the whole concept of an idol an idol. You see, there's, a, there's another John in the scriptures called John the Baptist. And we see with Jesus, he walked on the earth for about 30 years like an ordinary human being. And most people had no clue. They were like, here's a nice carpenter from Nazareth. They didn't have eyes to see. They didn't know who he is. You know, and so for many people these days, it's like, hey, Jesus, nice guy, prophet, historical, interesting historical figure, or 
You know, people have their ideas about Jesus. And then around at the age of 30, Jesus went to be baptized by John the Baptist, his cousin. And then as John saw Jesus, but with the eyes of discernment, eyes that could see who he truly is, John could declare, behold, behold, see the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John could see, not with physical eyes, but the eyes of his heart. And so that's the, that's the defining thing. Are we beholding who Jesus is? Are we seeing him for who he is? Is he above it all? Are we in awe of who he is? Is he high and lifted up above everything else in our lives? If, it's only possible when we see like John the Baptist saw. When we see with the eyes of our hearts and realize this is who he is. He is worthy of all praise. He is worthy of all honor. But for those who have idols like Judas, down the line, it's... it's it's pain, it's disappointment, it's betrayal, you know? And I believe none of us wanna be the Judas, but the truth is every single one of us can be a Judas. I can be a Judas if I allow an idol. Okay, and this is important, so we have to, so I'm, I'm trusting for some, some Holy Spirit light to shine upon our hearts so that we can deal with those things that compete with Jesus and that we can lift Jesus up to his rightful place. Amen. So the truth is this. Every one of us are made, designed, purposed to worship. Every day, continuously. We were made by God to worship. Every person on the planet worships every day, continuously. Even the atheist somewhere, he's worshiping. What is the atheist worshiping? Well, his intellect or materialism or I know better or self. A lot of people are worshiping self. They worship themselves. You are made to worship. The question is, what are you worshiping? Worship is not just on a Sunday like we are now singing worship. No, every day, continuously, we are worshiping. What are you worshiping? Because that will show you which gods are in your life. A lot of people worship themselves. That's why they do rebellion and do whatever they want to do because I, I am God. Now, there's no accountability. There's no one day judgment. There is no God. So, hey, I can do whatever I want to do. Worshiping self, worshiping our sin, worshiping things. But everyone is worshiping continuously. You know, if you even look at history, what, what often happens is, is that, you know, God, who is a good God, he blesses us with gifts. And then what do we do? We turn the gifts of God into God's and we worship it. We take the gifts of God and we turn it into God's and we worship it. Eh? Like over the ages, God blesses us with the sun. And what do people do? They worship the sun, the source, or the moon, or the trees. And you say, hey, that's just primitive people. You know, that's how they would do things. Well, today, a lot of people are actually worshiping nature. Mother nature, our wonderful source and creator. Uh, no, God created nature. We are to steward nature and be a good steward of our environment or whatever else. But we're not supposed to worship nature. As if it created us. No, a loving God created us. I, and as I love Wednesday night's Creation Ministries International, which is awesome to see how scientific evidence aligns with biblical history. It's incredible. God created us. But our nature is to worship. What are you worshiping? 
What are you worshiping? So I want to, I want to come and I want to show us. I want to shine that spotlight on our hearts so we can realize what are we worshiping. We tend to take the gifts of God and make it God's. Let me give you another example. So sometimes over the years, I've seen this, you know, young adults, they come to church. Woo, man, they are excited about Jesus. Worship, they everywhere. Until the boyfriend shows up or the girlfriend. And then I'm like, where are you? No, I found my love of my life. Woo, thank you, Jesus. Eh? And then no more. Jesus, no longer passion of our lives. Because actually we were just hoping to find the spouse. This, the idea of the spouse became our God. That's what happens. Uh, or somebody maybe, they don't have much. I see some of the students and, you know, a lot of our churches are at university campuses. So I see it. Yo, the students they are passionate about Jesus, on fire, but they have nothing. They don't have money. There's a lot of space for Jesus. And then they get the degree, then they get the job, then they get the car and the house, and, the, uh, and, the, uh, and then no space for Jesus because they had all the other things. And then the, the things of this world takes over their lives. And they, they, they allow the things. So the human heart tends to turn the gifts of God into God's. And then we worship. That's where the affections go. That's where the time go. That's where the passion goes. We all are, we all are passionate. And some people are like, oh, I'm not so passionate about you. Is it, we all are passionate. The question is what? About what? Where are you pouring out yourself? The things of this world or Him. The things of this world or Him. So I want to help us to not turn the gifts of God into God's. So here's a powerful quote. I've used it before, but it just really speaks into this. It says, as God is exalted to the right place in our lives, a thousand problems are solved all at once. Oh, I love that. As Jesus is exalted to his rightful place, it's just suddenly there's order. The affections aligned. The love for him, obedience follows Jesus. Suddenly things fall into place. A thousand problems are solved all at once. When Jesus is given his rightful place, when Jesus is above it all, no competition, no competition. Come on, say it, Jesus above it all. That's what you want to do. That's what you want to have. And I know we all say, well, Jesus is above it all. But I tell you, the heart lies. The, the enemy creeps in to our hearts and fills the, 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 our affections. And the opposite is also true, that a thousand problems are created when we exalt other things. A thousand problems. It might not be immediately. It might not be immediately, but I tell you, as we exalt other things and the affections start moving other places and then the feet follows, the heart follows, and then down the line, you're like, what did I do? What has happened? What pain, what tragedy, what disappointment? Because the idol leads us astray from Jesus, and it's deceptive. It's not clear cut. It is deceptive. I'm going to show you that uh, in, in a moment. So the moment we exalt anything else but Jesus, it's called idolatry. It's a massive problem. I'll unpack it in the rest of the series, but it's a massive problem over the, in the Scriptures, Old Testament. We, all, we, we see the idols coming, and then the pain and the problems that follow. Okay, so you and I, we want to see Jesus for who he truly is, eyes, heart, a heart that discerns, a heart that can see who he is so that we can exalt him. Okay, so let's look at this. Revelation chapter 1, 
verse 12. Now, this is John the Beloved, the one who, that was, who knew Jesus probably better than anyone. And now we're in the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation, it is the revelation of Jesus. So when you read the book of Revelation, what are you looking for? Oh, who is the Antichrist? No. <laughs> who is Jesus? It's the revelation of Jesus. In the midst of all these things that happens in our world, he must be preeminent. Some people are obsessed with the Antichrist and who it is and what. I'm like, hey, get your eyes back onto Jesus. That even that can be a distraction. You see, what happens, what happens is that good things are turned into gods, even in church world. So we take the things that God blesses us with and we exalt it to a place where it should not be. I've shared this before, but just to say it again, it's like even like worship. Like worship times that we were worshiping, it is so easy to worship worship and not worship Jesus. We worship the vibe, we worship the beautiful music, we worship the feel, oh, it's wonderful, but we're not actually focused on Jesus. We're not worshiping Jesus. Worship Jesus. For so many people, they take the things that God gives us and so exalt it. Like they take the Bible and they exalt it to be God. When it, no, 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 it's the Word of God that points us to God. But if you exalt the Word, the Bible, to be God, it becomes an idol. To give you an example, for many people these days, it's like their trinity is God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Bible. You realize that's not the trinity, huh? Eh? Holy Spirit. That's what the Pharisees did. They exalted the law, and when Jesus himself stood right in front of them, even rebuking them, they were like, crucify him. What did they do? Idol. They exalted the law. They exalted the Bible to be God. No, we're supposed to have a relationship with God. They exalted their authority. They exalted their influence. They became an idol to them. They worshiped their ministry, and therefore they couldn't see Jesus when he appeared, God when he appeared. So that's what we do in church world. We take the things of God and we exalt it. Even like we pursue healing when we should be pursuing the healer. Amen? We pursue blessing when we should be pursuing the blessor, Jesus. I tell you, it's so easy to get these things confused. And it's biblical. We're pursuing what is biblical. No, Jesus above it all. Amen? Now we'll unpack that. Even in the Fivefold Academy, we're going to unpack that some more on Tuesday. Okay, so let's look at this. Revelation 1 verse 12. This is where John sees Jesus. It says there, when I turned to see who was speaking to me. Now, John is in the spirit. He's in the spirit realm. He said, I saw seven gold lampstands. And standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was like, I know this person. Someone like the Son of Man. Someone like the one I knew when he walked on the earth. But he's different. He is glorified. And then it says there, and he was standing in the middle of the lampstands. Now, the lampstands represents the seven churches. It says that Jesus was at the center of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. Now, this is critical. So Jesus is standing amongst these lampstands. He's revealed as the center of the church. And as we know, Scripture says, he's also the head of the church. But it's so easy in the church world today, and I'm preaching it myself, for preachers, for church leaders to exalt ourselves to the point like, ah, I am leading the church. And we push Jesus out. I'm like, no, no, Jesus, you're the head of the church. We're going to follow you. We're going to preach what is, what is true and what is uncomfortable at times, but we're going to follow you. Jesus, you're the head of the church. Because if we allow idolatry in, even like the fear of man, it will cause us to lead the people of God astray. Jesus, preeminent. Jesus, the head. Jesus, the center. Okay, so we want to get Jesus at the center of our lives and at the center of the church. Okay, so let's continue. It says, 
He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. A long robe with a gold sash around his chest. I I love what Charles Spurgeon said about this, the golden sash. He says, it is to declare the superiority of his service. Because he is, what Jesus doing at this time in heaven, he is interceding for us. He is standing in the gap for us, his people, his brothers and sisters in Christ, to declare the golden sash, to declare the superiority of his service, the royalty of his person, the dignity of his state, the glory of his reward. We are his ultimate reward. He no longer cries out of the dust, but he pleads with authority. A king as well as a priest. Our cause is safe enough in the hands of our enthroned Redeemer. Speaks about him as high priest. Speaks about of him as the king of kings. It speaks of him praying for us, interceding for us. The one that is standing in the gap for us. The golden sash across his chest. Let's continue. It says his head And his hair were white like wool. As white as snow. It speaks of the purity of Jesus. And his eyes were like flames of fire. Love that. Come and say, eyes as a flame of fire. I want want it to sink in. What is it? The eyes of fire, it pierces the soul. When Jesus looks at us, I want to say to you, he sees everything. His eyes pierce. He sees into the depths of our souls, into the depths of our being. Jesus is omniscient, all-knowing. He's God. He's omnipresent through the Holy Spirit. He's everywhere. He's omnipotent. He is the almighty. Jesus is above it all. He sees your thoughts. He sees your fears. He sees all your actions, your deepest, darkest secret, he sees it. He knows it. He knows it. And that's important to understand that he sees everything. We can hide nothing. His eyes are fire. Eyes are fire that cleanses, but eyes also that can ultimately bring judgment to the rebellious and the continuously disobedient, those who do not repent and find themselves in their sins on judgment day, then it's trouble. Eyes of fire. Come on, you have to see it. See with the eyes of your spirit. I'm trusting for this revelation to sink in. It continues, verse 15. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace. Polished bronze. His feet speaks of his walk was perfect. Blameless, spotless, sinless, and therefore divine judgment has been allocated to him. Jesus has the right to judge on judgment day because of the way he walked. Jesus walked in in perfection, sinless, blameless, fully obeying his heavenly father, going to the cross to die for us, fully obedient to the last point of what God, his father, asked of him, dying for our sins. And therefore he was exalted to the right hand of the father above every other name, every principality, every power. Jesus is above it all. And now he has the right. Divine judgment has been given to him at that point. In the future, but also, I mean, God can do, Jesus can do whatever he wants to do. But his heart is to give mercy, forgiveness, cleansing, freedom. That is his passion. But that's why we have to see him for who he is and come to him. And then it says, and his voice thundered. Come on, say thundered. Thundered. Like mighty ocean waves. You can almost just feel these waves crashing in. Just shaking the earth, shaking his voice. It's powerful. His voice spoke into being and creation was. His voice speaks and mountains move, obstacles move. His voice speaks and the earth 
trembles. His voice, his word is powerful. Come on, you have to see it. You have to get a revelation of who he is. And when your voice aligns with his voice, there's authority to, to change atmospheres, to shift things as we spoke about over the last few weeks. His voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. Come on, you have to get this revelation. You have to see it, feel it. See him for who he is. Verse 16, he held seven stars in his right hand. Sharp, two-edged sword came from his mouth. It's like the, the power of the word spoken from him. And the seven stars, it speaks of the, the angels of the churches, seven churches, seven stars. There's different opinions about this because the word angel can be translated messenger. So it could be speaking of the leader of the, each of those local congregations. And it says, he has them in his hand. Now that comforts me. I'm like, Lord, I'm in your hand. Protection, blessing, safety, favor. But also it's like, I'm watching you. Holy reverence. He's watching. It's his church. I have the fear of God on me. Because I know you, the people of God, his people, his children. I have the fear of God on me because I know the Lord's watching me. No compromise. No stretching of the truth. No sin. No compromise. Purity, holiness, because he sees and I'm in his hand. In his hand for blessing, but also in his hand is like, I'm watching. And I want to release this. Over us. Jesus, above it all. So what should our response be? Be in all. Be in all. Jesus, above it all. So be in all of who he is. Be astounded. Be amazed. Be blown away. Let it shake you. Let it, let it impact you. You need, we need a revelation of the greatness and the glory of God. It will instantaneously deliver you from a whole bunch of nonsense in your life. Instantly. That's what the fear of God does to us. It continues there. And his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. Imagine like the sun, if Jesus is here in his glory, the sun itself radiating, you can't look into his face. Why worship the sun when you can worship the son of God? God, it became flesh. The sun in all his brilliance, verse 17, and this is John, the beloved who walked with Jesus, and now in his glorious state, it says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. Yo. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. That is the impact of the glory of God. Power, the, the, the source of, of everything. His word keeps the universe together. And so when you stand in his unfiltered glory, it's going to just, it's going to rock your world. So part of me is like, Lord, I want that. I just want to be in your glory. I want to in your glory, your radiating glory that burns out of my being anything that's not of you, Lord. May we see him for who he is. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. <laughs> I'm like, are you, are you you're kidding, right? <laughs> don't be afraid. I am the first and I'm the last. So he's saying, don't be afraid but fear him. Sounds like a contradiction, eh? Don't be afraid. The fear of the Lord, this holy awe, doesn't cause you to run away from God. It causes you to run to him. It's powerful. I'll show you now in the scriptures. It is so powerful. It says, don't be afraid. Don't run from him. Run to him, but reverence him. Be in awe of who he is. It instantaneously delivers you from Stupid. It's awesome. The fear of the Lord. It instantaneously delivers you from stupid. That's what it does. It like wakes you up, shakes you, brings clarity of heart and mind. And you're like, no, I'm stopping with that nonsense. I'm going to follow Jesus because he's the king of the universe. 
is glorious. He is the first. He is the alpha. Before anything was, He is. He is the last. He will usher in the coming age when He returns on the clouds. He will usher us into the next age. He's the beginning. He's the end. And the very hinge of history hinges on Him at the cross. Before Christ, after Christ. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the I am. And He is worthy. He is above it all. Amen. Come on, say it. Jesus above it all. He is above it all. When you see him for who he is, your life will realign. Your life will realign. The, the rubbish in your life will be, will be, will be f- washed out. It is, it's, it is glorious. It is wonderful to see him for who he is. Okay, so but now the problem Here is where the problem comes in. Jesus is above it all. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's reigning from heaven above. But where's the problem? The problem is here with you, with me on the inside. It's like when you are born again, your spirit is made alive and your spirit is made perfect, washed by the blood of Jesus. And then in that moment, you receive your true north. So here's a picture of a compass. Put the compass up, please. Here's a compass. So the moment you are born again by the Holy Spirit, your spirit comes alive. You're washed by the blood of Jesus. And suddenly, like, you want to know him. You You don't want to do wrong anymore. You want to follow Jesus. You want to know him. You want to, you want to, it's like your, your, your true, the compass. You receive this compass that points true north to Jesus. You want to know him. You want to follow him. You want to obey him. That is what happens when we are born again by the Holy Spirit. But so what is the problem? The problem is you have what's called the soul, soul heart. There's a connection there. They all know exactly where everything, how, how it all functions. But bottom line is you have a soul. And that soul, when an idol comes in, when affections for other things come in, it pulls your true north off. It's like adding a little magnet to your compass. And suddenly it's pointing a few degrees, not to true north, but somewhere else. And why is that a problem? The problem is because from your perspective, you're still going true north. I am on track. I am following Jesus. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. And I'm following Jesus. And I'm doing this for Jesus. But you don't realize there's an idol. There's a false something that crept in. And it's the flesh. And it's pulling your true north off track. And you are merrily going along pursuing. You think Jesus. And that few degrees off over time, it takes you off to a completely different place. That is the problem, okay? So we need to become aware of this. Let me show you the, show this in the Scriptures. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. It says, thus says the Lord, cursed, uh, Amplified says, cursed with great evil is the man who trusts in man and makes fleshy strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. Cursed with great evil is The person who trusts in anything else but Jesus. Are you seeing it? The heart departs. Something else, even Christian, even something good, even something godly, pursuing something, but it's but there's self-deception that has crept in those heart departs from the Lord. The idol brings a curse and the idol opens a spiritual door for the enemy to come in. Access for you. That's what happened to, I said to Judas. He loved money more than Jesus. Opened the door, heart departed. Evil came in and he betrayed Christ. Okay, let's continue. Jeremiah 17 verse 9. Verse 9 and 10. It says, the heart is Deceitful above all things. Come on, say deceitful. What does it mean? It means it lies to you. You lie to yourself. You lie to yourself. 
Okay, just that's, the, that's deception. You're like, you're not realizing it, but you are lying to yourself. And I'll give you an example in a moment. But it says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Nothing lies like a heart that is enticed by an idol. Desperately wicked, who can know it? Well, praise God, he knows. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So praise God, we have a partner in the Holy Spirit with God. He can come and shine his light upon our hearts and say, hey, there's an idol there. Hey, you are lying to yourself. Hey, <laughs> Jesus above it all, not, a, not other things. So let, let me give you an example of how this works. It's like Jesus, in, I think in Luke chapter 17 or somewhere around there, Jesus says basically that offenses will come. Offenses will come. What does it mean? It means you will be disappointed. In people, in the church, and in life at times. That's how life works, okay? And so we see this so often. It's like somebody gets offended. They get disappointed. And then you ask them how they're doing, and they're like, no, I'm fine. I am not offended with that idiot. Not offended. Not offended at all. But if you evaluate the fruit of your heart, the fruit of your life, you resent that person, maybe even hate them. So you, you have to like evaluate yourself. What, what is the fruit that's coming out of my life? What is the fruit coming out of my heart? And but so we, we tend to deceive ourselves, say, no, I'm fine, and yes, I have forgiven. But if you check the fruit in your heart, there's resentment, there's even maybe hatred, there's ungodly anger, and it's all stuffed down somewhere in your heart, and it pulls your compass off track. And offense. The Bible says offenses lead to deception. So what then happens is you might be in this church and you like got offended or upset about something. And then at some point you're like, I'm not getting fed in this church anymore. Andre's preaching isn't so good. It was much better a few years ago. But the problem isn't here. The problem is here. You got offended. You need to deal with that offense. And then people would like, then they go to another church, which is fine. And then they would sit there, wonderful, receiving, receiving. Then they get offended. And then suddenly I'm not getting fed in this church anymore. And then somewhere down the line, they're like, ah, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to be in community. I can just watch a little bit online every now and again. I'm sorted. And what? You are completely deceived and disobedient to the word of God because the word of God says you should be in community. Okay, are you seeing it? So it takes you down this path because of that original offense, that original wound, that disappointment of the heart, of a wound on the inside, and then the flesh comes in. Because what also normally happens when we get offended or hurt uh, by, by people, we tend then to turn to idols for comfort. We turn to the alcohol or we turn to the whatever, pornography, or we turn to things in our lives to, 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 to feed the pain. An idol. If you have pain, take it to Jesus. Take it to Jesus or you will be comforted by something else and opens a door and the enemy can come in. But bottom line is your compass gets pulled off track. And what do you say? What do you think? You're like, I am right. But you're actually deceived. You've deceived yourself and you find yourself going off track. There's another God. There's an idol. Instead of dealing with the things, and we see, I see this with pastors. I see this with so many people. They don't even see it, but they're unable to reconcile. They're unable to forgive. They're unable to deal with that wound, and then their pain becomes their idol. Don't let pain, don't let that pity party become your God. Don't let poor me become the primary thing in your life. Amen. I am preaching better than your face is telling me. <laughs> but may the Holy Spirit come and shine light. This is so important. That compass, put the compass on again there. That compass, that is your internal ability to discern and to guide your life. If your true north is off because of an idle flesh pulling you, pulling you astray, you're going to lose your way. 
You're going to make any, something else. You're going to exalt something else. I, I really feel it's a word for somebody here. You have exalted your pain. You have exalted your pain to become your God. You have found your identity in your pain. You found, you're finding that, that in that pity party thing, you found something there, and that is, that's an idol. It's a false God. That is not Jesus. Okay, so I really feel that's a word for somebody. A pity party is idolatry because it's poor me. No, worship Jesus. Worship Jesus. Exalt Jesus. Follow Jesus. We never have the right to say, poor me, so I'm going to stop following Jesus. Amen? Don't do pity parties where you get comforted by pity and not by Jesus. He is the one that comforts. He is the one that heals. He is the one that strengthens us. Let's follow, let's follow him. So Jesus above it all. So be in awe of him. Come on, say it. Be in awe. Be in awe of who he is. Turn your heart to him. Turn your mind to him. So let me take you to a few, a few verses just quickly just to show you what this awe, this fear of the Lord looks like. Because the fear of the Lord, the awe of God is the solution to idolatry. Because it exalts Jesus back to the place that he should have in our hearts and minds. Isaiah 33 verse 6. It says, wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times. And we know the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. The moment the fear of God kicks in, it's like, as I said earlier, it delivers you from stupid instantaneously. It's like thinking clearly, that's crazy. Let's follow Jesus. Okay? It's like adulterous thoughts, tempted, 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 and fear of God, boom. No, that's stupid. Not going to do it. I am going to be faithful to my wife. Okay? That kind of thing. Is that the fear of God just immediately delivers you from stupid. It says, your wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Oh, that's good. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. It is like God's reward, God's treasure that he wants to pour out into your life. It is the divine supernatural grace upon our lives to, 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 to be in awe of him. To be amazed at his greatness, at his glory. To see him for who he is. To flush the idols out of our hearts and minds and lives so we can just worship him. You are made to worship. Worship him. He is above it all. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Come on, say treasure. 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 It's his treasure. It is such. It's beautiful. It's glorious. It is not to be afraid of him, but to fear him. Some would say, no, 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 no. You shouldn't have any fear in a relationship. I'm like, have you ever been married? <laughs> I tell you, I am afraid of my wife. I fear my wife if I want, if I want to be stupid. If I want to do stupid, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm like, woo. My wife, she, she discerns as well. She is sensitive, so she picks up anything. I haven't even thought of sinning, and she's already, hey, are you? No, 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 no sin. Mm -mm. And it's good. There's a holy accountability between husband and wife, both ways. We hold one another accountable. It's like I would tell my wife, hey, this is the way I want to live. This is how I want to fulfill my days. This is what, how I want to spend my time. And if I start wasting my time or... God forbid procrastinating like my wife shared about last week. Hallelujah. Not allowed. Focus. Okay, but the fear of the Lord, it is good. Holy accountability in our marriages are good, all with friends, and it's good. Okay, the fear of the Lord is his treasure. Isaiah 11, 3. It says, his delight. Come on, say Delight. Delight is in the fear of the Lord. This speaks of Jesus. This speaks of the spirit that rested. If you read the previous verse, it speaks about the seven-folded spirit that rested upon Jesus. And it says, his delight is in the fear of the Lord. This is how Jesus lived when he walked on the earth. His delight, that's why Jesus could, he didn't fear man because he feared God, his father. He had a holy reverence for his God and father to show us how we are supposed to live. And he's 
delight was in the fear of the Lord. So he obeyed his heavenly father in every possible way. And that's why he was sinless. And that's why he could be exalted above all. Jesus is above it all. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Delight. Come on, let's let this become our delight. Because you have to evaluate your life. Because this is how deception works. You lie to yourself. So you can tell yourself, hey, but I prayed the sinner's prayer like 10 years ago. God baptized. And I come to church every now and again. So I'm sorted. Doing my thing. A little bit of Jesus on Sunday. And then you know, back to life. But evaluate. Where are your affections? How do you spend your time? Do you love him, truly adore him and love him or not? Because you will see that in how you spend your time. If you love him, if you adore him, if you are in awe of him, guess what? You're going to spend time with him. You're going to set time aside. You're going to be in his word. If you adore him, if you are in awe of him, if there's any compromise, any sin, anything, anything, the smallest little something, guess what? You're going to deal with it because you are in awe of him. He is Lord. He is King. That is the fear of the Lord. That is the awe of God. But we can deceive ourselves. Hey, well, I prayed the sinner's prayer, but I'm actually just living for myself. He is not Lord of my life. Then you have to change something. And then the root cause is idolatry. There are other stuff in your lives that you have exalted to the point where your affections are going there instead of to Jesus. That's the problem. Remove the idols. Guess what? Boom. In one moment, your affections will turn to Christ because they have just no other option. So we have to evaluate because we tend to lie to ourselves. How do you know that you are truly in awe of Jesus? You deal with your stuff. You walk in the light. And you follow him. That is the test of Jesus being King of kings and Lord of lords in your life. So I want to encourage you. Let the fear of the Lord flood in. Last verse I want to read. Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. I love that. We are receiving the kingdom of God that cannot be shaken. The kingdom is coming and will keep on coming if we allow the Lord. And that kingdom will come in us. If you have the fear of the Lord, the reverence of God in your life, you will become unshakable, immovable. Doesn't matter what comes. Hell can break loose. People can accuse you. When you have the fear of the Lord, you're going to be anchored. Your true north will be focused and you will follow Jesus. It is incredible. The kingdom within you, the kingdom within you, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. So let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Serve God, not God serve us. He's not a you know, golden lantern that you rub the genie. Because then you're God. You're God. You're the boss. Three wishes. Thank you. Jesus, thank you for my wishes. No. The fear of the Lord is you're God. I'm not. I'm serving you. I'm following you. I'm pursuing you. You are God and I am your servant. Okay, that's the, the, yes, we are sons and daughters of God, beautiful, absolutely. But the test of Jesus being above it all is that we serve him. Even when it's uncomfortable. Even when you're like, well, well the, the, I obey Jesus, but it's not work. Everything isn't perfect. That's okay. Just follow Jesus. It's going to get better. It always works out well when you follow Christ. Amen? Serve him. And then it says, serve him with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. And that word reverence, just want to quickly put that up. The complete word study dictionary defines reverence as, I love this, profound, adoring, awed, 
respect, reverence, profound, adore him, awed, respect. When God speaks, I obey. When he speaks, I follow. He is God. He is above it all. He is above it all in every area of our lives. That's how it should be. You know, we are trusting the Lord for revival. We are trusting God for a move of the Holy Spirit like we have never seen before. It will not happen without the fear of God. Won't happen without the fear of God. Because the fear of God causes you and me to be ruthless with sin. Ruthless with compromise. We can't allow Compromise in any areas of our lives. Is there forgiveness? Absolutely. Freedom from shame? Yes. No guilt, no shame. But we have to bring things into the light. Cheating on your taxes? Repent. Compromise somewhere? Pornography? Lie to your boss? Repent. Talk to somebody about it. Bring it into the light. You know, that's unacceptable. When I lie about anything, just stretching the truth a little bit, I am agreeing with the enemy. God can't bless that because you're taking on another nature. I tell you, some of the worst things in the church world right now is pornography. It is killing so many people. They say about two-thirds of all Christian men, two out of every three, are doing pornography. 50% of pastors. It will destroy your life. The fear of the Lord says, I'm going to walk in the light. The fear of the Lord, the awe of God says, I'm going to bring into light. I'm going to talk to somebody. I'm going to get freedom. And I tell you, the moment you do that, the moment you humble yourself and you deal with the things in your life, I tell you, that moment you do that, life and blessing and freedom will flood in. For some of us, you might say, I'm struggling to connect with God. Man, I've tried this Christian thing and I'm church and praying and Bible. It doesn't work. I tell you, deal with the idols in your life and you will instantly connect with God. Instantly connect with God. The moment you humble yourself, you bring things into the light and you confess, compromise, lying, lust, whatever it might be, worldliness, whatever it might be, drinking too much, whatever, anything that's just is messing up your life. The moment you say, hey, I am running to the alcohol it's become my God. It's become my idol. It's become my comfort when Jesus should be my comfort. The moment you speak to somebody, then freedom can flood in. Amen. Don't make the gifts of God gods. Jesus above it all, so be in awe.